Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. <laughs> Welcome to this event, BRICS, The World Upside Down, which is a film screening and a fascinating panel discussion on one of these topics of our times. The Geneva Graduate Institute is extremely pleased to, uh, to collaborate on this event with the International Film Festival and Forum on Human Rights and the Geneva Observer. Ladies and gentlemen, the word BRICS is in every word's thoughts. Because it's something new. Not that new, but new on our imagination. The Eurasia Foundation Top Risk Report 2024 has essentially argued that the BRICS is a red herring, which means it's not that important as it should be. And it argued the BRICS will not emerge as a China-led rival to the G7 this year or anytime soon. This is the top risk report of the Eurasia Foundation. Well, from a Geneva standpoint and our engagement in the academic world, we think this might be a, a slight underestimation of what the BRICS can stand for as a diplomatic forum and also as an expression of the era of diplomatic constellations um, that we are living in because diplomacy has changed. Power politics is not everything. And what better opportunity to discuss all of these dimensions than having the film screening and also the panel discussion later today. Um, so we're very pleased to have this discussion here today. And uh, I'm now turning over to, uh, of course, Philippe Motas, the founding editor of the Geneva Observer. And then later on in the evening as a moderator, Jamil Chad, the journalist at the Gen Geneva Observer, and of course, proud alumni of the Geneva Graduate Institute. Thank you very much and enjoy the evening tonight, in particular, the discussions. Thank you. Philippe? Thank you. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for being here with us tonight. I'm Philippe Mortaz, the founding editor of the Geneva Observer, dedicated to, to the coverage of international Geneva. Uh, it's great to be here. Thank you to the Graduate Institute for hosting us in this event that we're producing in partnership with the Human Rights Film Festival. Uh, we're delighted, really, to be here. It's an important conversation. Uh, I'll be brief. Uh, allow me, by the way of introduction, uh, two quotes. Uh, one is from The Economists this week. When asked about Western civilization, Mahatma Gandhi is said to have quipped that such a thing would be, quote, a good idea. The second advertisement for the GEO is the headline of a GEO story in April of last year that Jamil and I wrote. The headline was, and that was before the Johannesburg summit, that was in April, Xi Jinping and Lula are bromance that has the West worried. I think that pretty much uh, sums up uh, tonight's conversation. Uh, that's the world order is, is, is indeed being changed at, at warp speed under our eyes is, is quite obvious. What is not obvious at all is how will it proceed? Where will it lead? One thing we're sure, and I agree with Akim, is that this realignment of the global center of power has and will have and continue to have a massive impact on, on international Geneva. So you'll be looking at a great film that, that talks about the origins of the need for this realignment, and then we'll have this fascinating conversation with the distinguished members of the panel. So enjoy the screening, enjoy the discussion. Thank you very much. Good evening to every one of you. I'm Jamil Chaji. I'm a journalist. I'll be your moderator tonight. Um, please, before we start, a round of applause to Jean Lamorin. He's here. Uh, fantastic film. As I said, I'm a journalist. I have been covering, I would say, the global south issues for the last 25 years. But I really think this film 
uh, opens a lot of aspects of the debate that we're obviously going to discuss them, all of them here. But before we go to the debate, we have a very nice surprise. Actually, one of the characters of th this film, and I would say one of the actors of the global shift of power, is actually with us on uh, via video link, uh, Ambassador Amorim. Ambassador, uh, President Lula calls you his uh, personal troubleshooter uh, traveling around the world. So I hope President Lula doesn't call you for the next uh, 10 to 15 minutes and we can actually have uh, this very short debate with you. My first question, Ambassador, um, what is your assessment of the current state of the BRICS? What is the situation, I would say, of developing countries? And what do you make of this fantastic film? Thank you. Well, you've understood the question well, uh, Jamil. And first of all, thank you for calling me. And of course, my greetings to the director of the film uh, and all the audience there. Uh, if you understood, if you understood well, your question is for my assessment about the role of the BRICS at this point. Is that correct? Is that what I, what I understood? Correct. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I, the other day I was talking with a, pers with a personal friend who is a former foreign minister of a Western country. And he asked me uh, uh, why did he put so much so much emphasis on the BRICS, and even uh, we agreed with the, all the, the increase of numbers and so on. And I replied in a simple way, we support the BRICS to reinforce the G20. And I explained, uh, yeah, the G20 I think is what we were able to do, the international community, the most, the best possible combination so far, maybe with a small correction which will still be needed with two more African countries, but it's the best, the best combination of effectiveness and representativeness. This is, this is not easy, I have uh, for years worked with a, a very difficult question which is the, the Reform of Security Council and that always appears. And I think the, the, the G20 uh, is somehow the best synthesis of what is the world nowadays. The developed, the developing countries, the bridges and so on. But what was happening in recent years, um, I don't want to go deep into the reasons, but what was happening in the, in the, in the recent years is that the Western countries, especially the G7, was trying to take to, to, to take uh, agenda for them and thus fight some developing countries. But I know that after the, the after this latest increase in rates uh, and the reinforcement and then so on and the attention that's given to it, again they are putting more attention and more interest in the twenty. So it, it is just the best the best uh, hope for a more democratic world, more balanced, uh, and which could be the embryo of a reform for the United Nations even. Thank you, Ambassador. A second question to you. Uh, China has obviously a global ambition. Russia, uh, as we have seen, uh, has violated the UN Charter. Russia by no means is the only superpower who has violated the UN Charter. We know that and we saw in the film. On the other hand, Brazil just came out of a very uh, intense fight for democracy. How do you put all of these pieces of the puzzle together in a single uh, block of countries. What, uh, what do you have in common, I would say? Well, uh, I think, you know, uh, we uh, basically, the BRICS, we had founded, as you know before, the group called IBSA. IBSA was a kind of a group based on affinities. BRICS is a, a group based also to some extent affinities, but not necessarily affinities of values all, the, all along, but value, but an affinities of interest. I think we want a more balanced world. We don't want the world dominated by one simple 
to the power, was said in the past, you have heard maybe even my good friend, Madeleine Albright, referred to the United, late Madeleine Albright, uh, referred to the United States, the, the only remaining superpower. And of course, even if it was not our intention, there was an implicit arrogance in that, uh, in that kind of statement. And we don't want either China to be the only remaining superpower. So we want a balanced world, of course, we do what we can with me, peaceful me, uh, and of course with, uh, looking also to other questions which are of great importance, like diminishing inequality, dealing with uh, with uh, with the problems of uh, the climate, which are terrible pandemics. I mean, in all these respects, I think BRICS can give a contribution uh, to a more decision a decision making process which is more balanced and fair. Ambassador, and a last question basically to the uh, audience in Geneva, a city you know very well. Uh, the disarmament conference is not working at all for many years. The WTO is in a deep crisis also for many years. We have the pandemic treaty being negotiated and also with huge obstacles. What would be your message to Geneva either to stay relevant or change? How to do it? Well, one of the things that I regret most, you know probably that the, one of the last proposals that is there, in the, was there in the, in the Conference on Disarmament was, was, was called, maybe unfairly, hammering proposals, because these were collective work. But anyway, at that point it seemed possible, and we were very near to have an agreement, reasons which are beyond the point discussing now, we were not able. But what I regret most was the total failure of the of the Doha round, and I think that was by egoistic uh, attitudes. Uh, well, no, 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 no point in blame, blame sharing, or blaming one country or another. But I think also, apart from the specific interests of countries that, as you know, were contradictory and difficult to reconcile, I think there was a tendency. Uh, just after even that big failure of uh, 2008, uh, for the big powers to look for regional solutions. Regional solutions may be useful, but they are not, they don't replace the multilateral scene. And I regret very much to see that, uh, uh, the, to see the, 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 the WGO is specifically in, in the situation that it is now. But I would say, just to, to finish, that we don't, we don't lose hope. And I personally put a lot of hope on UNCTAD. UNCTAD will be this year 60 years. UNCTAD was a creation to a large extent of Brazilians. Raul Prebis, the, great, uh, the Argentinian friend, and the great support of, of Brazil. And I would hope that we can again, within a context, broader context of a reform of global governance, recreate some, 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 somebody that is uh, that uh, that would be good for trade and development. So my my greetings to all of there. I don't want to go on and on with this uh, 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 this kind of very very general uh, bureaucratic language. So go on and appreciate the film with much better. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Thank you for uh, sharing this uh, time with us. And please thank uh, President Lula for not calling you during these uh, 10, 15 minutes we had with you. Thank you. Bye-bye. And now I would like to call our guests. Please join me here. Don't leave me alone. Very good. So we're going to actually start now the debate. And I will start, Jean, first of all, again, thank you for this film. I will not say congratulate, uh, but I will thank you for this. I'm going to start with a round of questions here. And we'll come very shortly to you. 
Uh, first, Odd, thank you for being with us here in Geneva. From the US perspective, how does this earthquake or this attempt of change is being perceived? Thank you, Jamil, and uh, good evening, everyone. I'm very pleased to be here, and uh, the, congratulations again uh, for, for this very fantastic uh, film. Uh, so, and for more context, I am based in Washington, D.C., where I work on these, on these issues and try to elevate voices from the global south. And um, I'm not sure we could say that it, it is an earthquake, just because of the way it has been, at least the, the BRICS uh, in the past uh, year, I would say in particular, has been received. Um, I would say that in, in particular in August 2023, so around the BRICS summit, um, the coverage in the media in the United States has been quite polarized. Um, you had either the, the ones that were um, very much uh, dis uh, dismissing um, the initiative, and then the other ones that were really praising it as something, you know, an earthquake or something that was radically changed the world. Um, but I would say that th there was a, quite of a big uh, negative uh, uh, answer in the United States. Um, many, many media, many you know, think scholars, uh, thinker, th thinkers, generally speaking, um, kind of sidelines the BRICS as being you know nothing really, right? Um, it's it's uh, it's it's not it's, uh, it's so heterogeneous. Um, there is no clear agenda. Um, they won't really um, succeed in achieving any of their objectives, right? Um, so so there was quite a, a significant coverage, um, which I, I personally I believe is not um, you know it doesn't enable a, a balanced. Uh, uh, discussion and, and, di and dialogue. Um, and, and on the other side, as I mentioned, you had those that were really expecting a lot from the BRICS. And I think the truth is probably more in the middle, right? Um, in the middle, and that's why it is important to have nuanced discussions uh, uh, on, on, the, on, on such an issue. Excellent. Uh, we have the privilege of having um, Mrs. Aminata Traoré. Uh, and uh, en français? Je dois poser lui. Je dois poser la question en français. Ça va être dur. Ça va aller. Euh, on voit que le film euh, fait une relation très claire entre les États-Unis et l'Amérique latine. Mais les champs de bataille, euh, si on peut dire comme ça, euh, elle a des autres théâtres aussi. Un de ces théâtres, c'est aussi l'Afrique. Comment voyez-vous euh, cette relation euh, et comment voyez-vous le fait que les pays émergents aujourd'hui, peut-être, euh, sont là d'une façon, je ne veux pas dire définitive, mais au moins euh, euh, très présent. Par contre, en Afrique, on voit aussi une dispute très claire entre la Chine, la Russie, euh, l'Inde, même le Brésil, de fois, euh, présent. Comment voyez-vous tout ça à partir de votre continent non, une chose, bonsoir tout le monde, et c'est un immense plaisir pour moi de participer à ce festival et puis surtout cette partie de, du processus. Et les BRICS résonnent en Afrique comme un tournant, une opportunité à saisir en tant qu'arrière arrière cour de l'Europe. Il n'a pas été tellement question de l'Europe ici, mais nous, notre problème, c'est l'Europe. Et en, dans l'Europe, la France. Et la France au Sahel. Alors, ce qui se passe aujourd'hui, en fait, euh, est, il y a énormément de choses à faire ensemble, mais ce processus euh, et la naissance du BRICS, qu'est-ce que nous avons en commun Je crois que nous avons en commun... Euh, euh, non pas seulement la mémoire euh, euh, du, de, de la domination euh, de l'exploitation de l'humiliation et vu d'Afrique c'est ça les images ont montré si vous remontez et à euh, l'esclavage la traite négrière et la question et le néolibéralisme est, apparaît est nommé ici malheureusement dans l'analyse de notre situation il n'en est pas question on a l'impression que l'Afrique est toujours victime d'elle-même euh, il ne nous arrive que tout ce qui nous arrive c'est lié à l'ethnie la religion et autre chose mais référence est rarement faite au néolibéralisme et la question que moi je me pose est dans nos relations entre euh, BRICS, pays des BRICS nous, le Mali n'en fait pas partie on est loin du compte encore l'Afrique du Sud, si je prends l'Afrique du Sud mais même quand je prends 
le Brésil. Parce que moi, l'altermondialisme, nous nous sommes trouvés au Brésil par Lula. Et nous, le, le, nous caressions l'espoir d'un monde meilleur. Mais la question que je me pose maintenant, est-ce que les BRICS constituent, est-ce est que c'est le monde, l'autre, le monde meilleur que nous voulons, est-ce que c'est ça qui est, qui est à l'horizon avec les BRICS ou alors, est-ce que les BRICS, c'est une variante du néolibéralisme entre pays et, et écrasé par le système C'est la question que je me pose. Et qu'est-ce que l'Afrique va devenir dans tout ça Parfait. Uh, Andrea, that's a question for you. Andrea, that's a question for you. Is the BRICS a new form of, uh, I would say, domination as well, or at least in position of others? Uh, of others. Uh, how do you see the BRICS enlargement as well? But also, uh, can there be any uh, way out of all of these crises without a reform of global governance? Um, well, if you consider that uh, the BRICS exist for more or less 15 years, um, you have to ask yourself what happened besides the summits, the meetings, the rhetoric. Um, what has been the traction, the traction and action on the ground? Uh, and if you look, look, for example, at the New Development Bank, how many shareholders does the New Development Bank have? It's the five BRICS and three more. It's Bangladesh, it's Egypt, it's UAE. Um, and if you look a little bit into, okay, what kind of projects does this bank finance to really see what is the operational value, the added value also for the uh, developing countries, uh, you will realize um, that, take the example of, of Brazil, um, a lot of projects have been approved um, three have been cl completed, and, and the largest has been a one billion COVID recovery fund, which was matched, in fact, also by the same amount done uh, or um, given by, by the World Bank to Brazil. So if you look at that and you look at the traction, you ask yourself, okay, are they really so powerful as they are hyped up? If you look into what is their kind of objective, it's about um, making multilateral institutions more inclusive, more representative. Um, there's no concrete proposal yet for how to reform those kind of weak institutions in the UN system who might lack a certain representativity. Um, has there been any proposal on the Security Council reform? No, and I doubt there will be one because China is blocking. China has not agreed on a draft for discussion yet, besides of having had so many initiatives for Security Council reform. And if you look at the composition of the BRICS, you ask yourself, okay, what is the kind of interest of China to have India as a permanent member, perhaps, on the Security Council? There's none. Um, Brazil has joined the G4 initiative together also with, with Japan, Germany, and India. Um, would China accept Japan? No, probably not. Um, South Africa has the aspiration to become a permanent member for the African continent. Yeah, but there's large resistance, and particularly the new, new members, Egypt and Ethiopia, are competitors for South Africa. So you ask yourself, okay, how can you reconcile everything? So I liked your question to Ambassador Maureen, asking what is the kind of binding band amongst those BRICS states that could make it a very powerful forum? Excellent, uh, thank you very much. Now we finally go to the uh, producer, to the uh, author of this, mo this, this film. Jean, um, two questions for you. First, why did you decide uh, to make this film? And how does it establish a dialogue to the current, let's say, uh, world affairs and what we see today in the world? Well, uh, well, thank you everybody for being here. Merci beaucoup. Uh, C'est un plaisir d'être ici. Um, well, I decided to make the film. In fact, uh, I was a longtime fan of Noam Chomsky, and uh, I lived for a long time in the U.S. and had read lots of uh, Chomsky's books. And uh, when my father first retired after Dilma's first uh, government, uh, he started lecturing uh, around the world. And in one of these lectures, he was together in a panel with Noam. And he, knowing that I was a fan of Noam, he sent me a picture. And that's when I had the idea. <laughs> and I was like, that, that's, that. I immediately had the idea. And the name came first. I was like, if I am to do a film 
who is Celso, who is my father, and Noam Chomsky, I'd, I'd like to do something that you know talks about the global south and particularly about South America. At the moment, we were living uh, under Temer's regime, which was uh, right <coughs> after the, the coup, or the impeachment. Uh, so it was a very delicate moment. And the first conversation between the two was right before the 2018 election. So we didn't know that Bolsonaro was going to win, and we didn't know that the extreme right would take power. So it was a very delicate moment in Brazil, and that's why I decided to make the film. I said that this is something that is absolutely necessary. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, I'm not a specialist on BRICS, but I do think that it does represent a, uh, a multi a, a multi lateral uh, voice to the world, and it, it, a multipolar voice to the world. And it, it seems like it bothers a lot of people to have that, because so far we've followed you know, what's been imposed by the US and by Eurocentric view. And we can see that it really bothers a lot of people. Uh, I think it's very important that we have this. Uh, you know, the BRICS is not the UN. It doesn't have all the countries. So as my father uh, clearly stated, it started with IBAS. It started with India, Brazil, and South Africa, and with IBSA. And it evolved in, into BRICS. And BRICS uh, now will have uh, more countries. And more countries are joining. And I think it's important that other African countries are a part of it. I don't think the intention is to create something like uh, the G7. You know, it is to, create a, a, uh, to diversify it and create a more multipolar uh, polar world. And that's absolutely necessary if we are to fight climate change, inequality, and a lot of the issues that we presently have. Because obviously, uh, the West hasn't been able to provide solutions. You know, if you look at carbon emissions today, they're concentrated on the Western countries, and who's paying the price is us down south. You know, so giving voice to the global south and is, is part of what the BRICS is doing, and I think it's essential for change and for humanity to survive. Thank you, Jean. Uh, Minata, uh, j'ai compris que vous avez des doutes. Uh, sur euh, le rôle que le BRICS peut jouer euh, chez vous. Euh, mais ici à Genève, mm. on a vu euh, pendant la pandémie une discussion très forte sur le, le, la, les vaccins, euh, le, les propriétés euh, intellectuelles de cette invention euh, qui euh, est arrivée euh, au pays en développement euh, très tard ou des fois euh, d'une façon très je, je peut-être dire euh, fragile. Euh, comment voyez-vous voyez cette relation encore qui existe Est-ce que la dé décolonisation est finie Est-ce qu'il y a encore de, des éléments qui n'ont pas euh, coupé cette relation encore de, de déséquilibre des pouvoirs La partie vaccinale est, a été euh, vécue comme une l'une des expressions de, des relations, d'abord des inégalités. Les inégalités monstres à l'échelle des pays, des nations. Le Covid a mis tout ça en, en exergue. Plus récemment, la guerre d'Ukraine a montré le traitement des, de ceux qui venaient, des, des réfugiés ukrainiens et des migrants africains et quand on entend dire qu'ils ont les mêmes voitures que nous, les mêmes yeux bleus que nous, on se ressemble, on peut les accueillir, les autres peuvent mourir en Méditerranée ou chez eux. On est dans un monde de, de fous. Euh, moi, j'ai envie, j'ai vraiment envie, les choses vont tellement mal que s'il y a une lueur d'espoir quelque part, il faut la saisir. Et les briques, c'est ça. On a envie d'espérer, on a envie d'y croire. Mais la réalité, c'est que pour moi, il y a deux questions fondamentales qui sont insuffisamment débattues. La question du développement, le modèle de développement. Dès le départ, ce qui nous a été proposé à nous, est pays euh, dont est, dépend cruellement, terriblement, et les taux de croissance, les parts de marché, les dominants vont les chercher dans l'hémisphère sud. Toute la guerre, tout le racisme est fondé sur ça nous dire, vous ne pouvez rien par vous-même, nos valeurs 
nos institutions sont supérieures aux vôtres, donc, et faites ce que nous vous demandons de faire. Ça, c'est la nature des relations, qu'on le veuille ou non. Et la question du développement, le modèle de développement extraverti, dépendant, extractiviste qui nous est proposé, n'a pas vocation à créer des emplois chez nous, à lutter contre les inégalités. Deuxième question fondamentale qui n'apparaît pas suffisamment dans le film, c'est la question de la démocratie. Mais quelle démocratie Est-ce que les élections suffisent pour faire une démocratie Est-ce que la France a le droit d'annoncer, de, d'entrer, de pousser la CDAO, eh, qui n'est que, 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 que son cheval de Troie, à, eh, à déclarer la guerre au Niger, même si elle n'a pas eu lieu L'idée seulement de dire on va aller en guerre, intervenir militairement pour rétablir l'ordre constitutionnel normal est quelque chose de dingue. Mais c'est ça qui se passe dans les rapports entre les dominants et nous. Mais à l'intérieur maintenant, si nous sommes entre BRICS, et si nous ne posons pas ces deux questions, la Chine, la Russie, et la Turquie, l'Inde, et tous ces gens qui viennent vers l'Afrique aujourd'hui, est-ce que et est, et cette, cette quête d'alternative à la domination occidentale va passer par d'autres formes de domination entre nous parce que nous nous sommes interdits de poser les vraies questions, les enjeux du développement, quel modèle de développement, quelle transformation du monde en, en prenant soin des questions de climat. Quand vous parlez du Sahel, par exemple, et ce qui nous pas on est aujourd'hui, c'est une guerre et, et par procuration chez nous et entre des pays qui sont inféodés et au, au capitalisme et les autres, les pays de l'intérieur et, et enclavés comme les nôtres Mali, Burkina Faso, Niger par exemple, qui sont dans le collimateur du système en ce moment parce qu'il faut qu'on on, on nous ramène dans le giron de... de, de il faut qu'on qu soit... Il faut que l'Afrique s'ouvre. Il faut qu'elle s'ouvre pour qu'on continue à la piller, mais il faut que les Africains restent en Afrique, parce qu'il semble que nous constituons une menace pour la race blanche. Toutes ces questions sont posées. Excellent, and, and very interesting. Very interesting. You, you mentioned this because today I saw this very uh, striking data about the uh, Haitian crisis, the crisis in Haiti, uh, and that there is a global appeal, and the global appeal has been fulfilled with two percent of what was uh, requested by the UN. So maybe that also shows something. Andrea, I'm going to go back to you. How do you answer to this question on the model of development, on the vaccine, on the fact that developing countries, once again in the 21st century, got the vaccine so much later than everyone else, and obviously on the obscene inequality that still exists? Thank you. Well, I think uh, Madame la Ministre has touched on a lot of reasons why we have this, I would say, elevated lack of trust nowadays in the multilateral negotiations. And as you mentioned before, it currently spills out um, most openly, I would say, in the negotiations to a pandemic accord, um, where exactly the question is about Um, benefit sharing, about access to technologies, about access to know-how, and also local capacity building. So, but um, if you look into the kind of challenges for development, I think we also have to um, look uh, into the global finance architecture. We were talking about BRICS, and I mentioned the New Development Bank, um, but I think um, this is definitely also now uh, the time when we see pandemic war in Ukraine and, and Gaza, uh, climate change, um, has um, elevated the levels of debt of poor countries to, to a, a, a level that allows them not to really serve the public in health and education because of their debt service. So, And we have seen it over the last couple of years um, in April, Financing for Development Forum in New York, high-level political forum for development in New York in July, um, even the spring meetings of World Bank, or spring and autumn meetings, World Bank and IMF have taken it up, um, how to reform the global finance architecture. But not much is happening, and there are just little baby steps um, that we can, can note, note uh, in this regard, and I think we have to uh, also address that um, point when we talk about um, development, 
But I think also when we talk about development, we also have to look into tax revenues of countries. We have to talk about illicit financial flows uh, and their countries as well as OECD, for example, are lagging behind in implementation. So therefore, I think there are a lot of initiatives out there, um, but we have to, I would say, be a bit, be a bit more fervent in implementing. Thank you. Um, maybe Joan will not agree with me, but I saw a third actor in this movie uh, called the dollar. Uh, it was very, dollar? The dollar. He was very much present uh, in many of the discussions here. And I'm going to ask uh, Ode. Uh, we talk a lot about the BRICS, coherence of the BRICS, enlargement of the BRICS, uh, the new development bank. But there's a discussion that not always has, the, let's say, the headline, but it's very present, which is the fact that there is an attempt to reduce the dependency on the dollar. Uh, and that is basically one of the strategies uh, that was adopted now in South Africa during the BRICS uh, summit. My question to you again, uh, from the viewpoint of, of, of the US, is this a threat? Is this feasible? Uh, can the world today have an alternative to the dollar. Thank you. Thank you, Jamal. It's a very interesting question. It did make the headlines in DC. Um, again, uh, the, the coverage was mostly dismissing uh, of dismissive of the BRICS as being something that, at least in the near to medium to mid to even long term, uh, is not something that is uh, seen as uh, credible. Um, but again, I think that also shows, you know, what uh, Madame Tauri was saying. That I think it also mentions shows the difference, the, the huge gap between the conversations that happen in the West and then the, the 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 tangible issues, you know, life or death, right? Uh, human rights, uh, development, prosperity for populations in the South. Um, but in the United States, um, this question of the BRICS, uh, just like the question of uh, of the BRICS currency, just like the question of the BRICS or the question of reform of the international governance system, is really being perceived um, within the wider issue of great power competition, uh, anti-West, anti-United States. Uh, uh, efforts, so-called efforts, right? So we're always going back to this framing in Washington, D.C. Um, about, you know, whether this is uh, anti-West or anti-U.S. And frankly, actually, it is being presented as something that's anti-U.S. Um, um, and, and even though, you know, if you, if you look at um, the BRICS members and especially um, the members that have particular interests in the BRICS currency, so you could mention Russia, now Iran, um, China, especially as a way to um, overcome uh, the weaponization of the U.S. dollar, because there is, on on the one hand, there is the question of. Um, uh, using an alternative to the dollar for uh, more, uh, if not integration, but economic power within the BRICS uh, in terms of economic exchange exchanges. But there's also the question of overcoming or com uh, countering the weaponization of the U.S. dollar, which is uh, being discussed quite uh, quite a lot uh, uh, within these countries. Um, and I'm talking about sanctions, notably. Um, and and uh, even partners of the United States uh, across the regions within. The the BRICS, but also outside of BRICS, this is a question that is of interest, whether tomorrow they could be also um, the target of U.S. sanctions. But, but just, you know, again, I think the, 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 the debate that we are currently hearing, or at least that we heard last, last year, I, I, would, I would say that uh, since, uh, since the, the end of the BRICS summit, um, the coverage has diminished diminish quite a lot. Um, but, um, but it really shows, again, the, um, unfortunately, there is such a focus, a great focus on um, that dichotomy, right? Uh, it is uh, you're either with the United States or with, you are against it, right? Um, there is this uh, this uh, pushback against uh, these countries having their own agency. I think this is something that is mentioned quite quite well in in the film. Um, today we have countries within the BRICS and, and, and beyond that do want to be able to choose the partners um, to work with the United States, uh, to work with China. That doesn't mean that they are anti-US, that doesn't mean they are anti-West, the same way that uh, wanting to join the BRICS doesn't mean that you know uh, you are necessarily anti-West, even though yes, there are adversaries within the BRICS, uh, say the adversaries to the United States. But the, the, the way the debate is being framed it really shows um, uh, the, the, the priorities for the United States that 
that are quite in, in you know, stark contrast with the debate I was, uh, that are having in, in, in the South. I was in India just two weeks ago at the Regina Dialogue, and you can really see, you can really sense um, that, that difference of, uh, of priorities, of objectives, the, the positionality um, very much has a great impact on the way that we're having those debates. Super. Uh, by the way, I think the, it will be back in the headlines because the next summit is in Russia. So I guess it will be back in, in, in the headlines in the US. Jean, uh, back to you. Um, what message did you want to send with this film? It obviously has a very Brazilian uh, component. It tells the story of Brazil for the last uh, 50 years uh, or more. Uh, but what is the message you want to send to the world? With this film, well, the the message is in the in the sub in the second title, which is history doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. So we need to be aware of the rise of the extreme right worldwide, the power it has. Uh, we can see it with Argentina now with Millet, and unfortunately, most probably with the United States with Trump again. So in Brazil, it's the same thing. We had a, a Bolsonaro rally two weeks ago in Sao Paulo with hundreds of thousands of people. So this is a real threat. It's a threat uh, that denies climate change, uh, that does not talk about uh, people's rights. And so I think that's the essential message, that you know, the price of freedom is eternal vigilance. Super. Um, I'm going to ask. I'm going to ask a, que a common question to all of you, and then we're going to open uh, to everyone here. And the question is the following. How do you see the world order with this obvious distribution of power that is happening at this moment? Comment voyez-vous uh, la distribution de pouvoir au monde avec uh, uh, cette uh, situation ou ce uh, changement uh, dans la géopolitique? J'ai fait une traduction livre à partir de l'auteur. <laughs> C'était moi-même. Moi, moi j'ai envie de voir uh, les peuples jouer un rôle le plus important. Je, 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 je crains que et la manière dont les choses sont en train de se dérouler Eh, qu'il y ait une volonté politique réelle dont je ne doute pas et de créer euh, un monde multipolaire. Mais j'ai l'impression que euh, il, ça, ça risque d'être quelque chose de, comme on vous dit, de top-down, même si c'est à l'échelle mondiale. Je ne sens pas, je ne vois pas eh, une prise de conscience véritable de la part des peuples qui sont au cœur de ces processus. Et les gens ordinaires ne parlent pas de BRICS. Hein. Ils crèvent la dalle, ils, parlent, ils passent la journée à courir à gauche et à droite et chercher à émigrer. Non seulement l'Afrique, les, les, ce n'est plus vers l'Europe. Vous avez vu, c'est les gens qui partent maintenant vers l'Amérique latine et l'Amérique latine vers les États-Unis. Mais c'est une sorte de branle-bas de combat. Les gens sont en train de fuir dans toutes les directions. Il n'y a que les pays riches qui restent chez eux et protègent leurs biens et leurs intérêts. Les autres, tout, le, le, le Sud aujourd'hui, c'est comme ça. Mais moi, je ne vois pas dans le débat politique et une volonté d'enseigner, de permettre aux citoyens lambda de comprendre les enjeux économiques et géopolitiques. C'est le temps des peuples. C'est ce temps aujourd'hui, ce temps de tous les dangers devrait être le temps des peuples à travers une bonne compréhension des enjeux pour que lorsqu'ils sortent pour aller voter pour Paul ou Pierre, qu'ils sachent et quel est le dessin. Et celui qui veut qu'on qu lui confie le pouvoir, quel est son agenda. Or, ce n'est pas ça qu'on qu attend des, 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 des populations à la base. On leur demande seulement d'aller régulièrement aux urnes et de légitimer un personnel politique qui se met au service des multinationales et des oligarchies. Il ne faut pas que ce soit une histoire d'oligarques, parce qu'on a beau être ami avec le Brésil, par exemple, en son temps, 
sous Bolsonaro. Et quand je vois et, et la manière, la destruction de l'Amazonie, les forêts, le traitement, ce qui se passe en matière de non-respect de l'environnement, quand les mêmes viennent en Afrique subsaharienne chercher des terres arables pour produire pour l'exportation le, pendant que les Africains meurent de faim, ça me pose un problème. C'est pour ça que c'est une question et, au plan politique. Et l'heure est tellement grave qu'on ne peut pas jouer avec ces enjeux-là. Si nous devons bâtir et aller vers les BRICS, que ce soit les BRICS des peuples, plus particulièrement des jeunes, des femmes, et comme vous dites, bien sûr, les, les, les cultures, et cette dimension euh, me semble être, en tout cas, peut, peut donner une chance et aux BRICS comme alternative à ce que nous connaissons jusqu'ici. Et mettre aussi et, et le camp atlantiste en garde. Quand on nous dit à nous, euh, faites attention, euh, il ne faut pas euh, passer de l'impérialisme occidental à l'impérialisme russe, chinois, ainsi de suite, moi bon, j'ai envie de leur dire, bon, balayez devant votre porte, quoi. C'est-à-dire que et, 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 nous avons notre propre imaginaire et au plan politique et populaire, on sait pratiquement, on a appris, on a appris dans la douleur ce que la marche de l'histoire veut dire. Mais on voudrait pouvoir juger nous-mêmes de l'opportunité des BRICS, de quel contenu pour les BRICS, mais pour l'heure, je voudrais qu'au sein des BRICS, entre nous et dans le rapport avec les dominants, qu'on prenne en charge la question du développement de qu'est-ce que se développer veut dire, est-ce que ça va continuer, ça a été jusqu'ici une volonté d'occidentalisation du monde, c'est de ça que les gens ne veulent plus. Les peuples qui résistent aujourd'hui, en Afrique par exemple, qui revendiquent à travers les vêtements et tout, les gens se cherchent, mais ils se sont rendus compte qu'on a confondu développement et occidentalisation du monde, mais on continue de confondre démocratie et élection. Moi, ce sont mes deux combats se situent à ce niveau aujourd'hui, en faisant de telle sorte que la jeunesse africaine et le ventre des femmes noires qui est constitué aujourd'hui comme source de malheur pour euh, les dominants, et qu'on mette tout ça sur la table, que nous-mêmes nous soyons conscients du fait qu'il faut aujourd'hui un autre, un ordre mondial plus respectueux de tous nos droits. Merci beaucoup. Andrea. Well, I'm a strong believer in multilateralism and the UN system. <laughs> and I, I would say, despite of all the weaknesses, it's, it's not f perfect, it's far from perfect, but it's the only forum we have where each state had a vo has a voice and a vote. And we will not get anything better. Um, so I think we have to work with what we have. We have to adapt, certainly. But while we are adapting, I think we also have to make sure that in the push for progress, um, we are not losing a creed language, a creed language on human rights particularly. Um, and this is, I, I, from, from, from my uh, perspective, it's currently a very, very um, evident um, threat. Um, but I think also when we look into, okay, how can we have a better system? We should not focus only on institutions, decision-making processes. Um, we have to look a bit more into the soft fabric. I mentioned the distrust amongst member states. Um, you can see a lot of tendency towards the kind of perceiving multilateral politics as a zero-sum game. International relations, transactional. So I think this is also, and playing hand in hand with, with what uh, Joao mentioned, it's the populism that also brings this more and more into the multilateral realm. And I think we have to work on that um, because as I said, I don't think we will get anything better. Good. I will perhaps uh, bring a, a different answer because uh, I, I'm, I'm quite skeptical about the current international organizations. I think we actually need something better because they don't they don't work. And, and quite frankly, the crisis of legitimacy that we we see, I, I would even even go further and say that these institutions were never legitimate to start with. They were created in, in 1945 at a moment where most countries didn't exist because they were still colonized. So they were created by the minority 
majority for the interest of a minority. Um, so if we say that we won't get anything better, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid that that means that the world will never get better, that we are, you know, uh, populations will continue to suffer, that we'll continue to have domination systems uh, with the, the former colonial power being still the dominant forces. Um, however, uh, you know, I, I think the bottom line is we need change. We need change not today, not tomorrow, but we need change yesterday. Um, the, the, it is about time that we seize the moment, and we've talked about the accumulations of crisis, the debt crisis, the food crisis, climate crisis, the the, the, the security crisis that we see across the global south um, make this moment particularly uh, urgent. Uh, uh, and, and obviously, the, the demands are not new. We've, we've, we've been hearing them since the creation of these institutions, since the decolonization and before. Uh, I mean, frankly, since the colonization, we could, we could go even further back. Um, but um, that, that reform needs to happen, and obviously it is an extremely complex um, issue. There is no consensus. Um, there is no consensus within the BRICS. There is no consensus outside the BRICS within the Global South. And I don't think there is consensus in the West either. Um, so I think it's also, we also need to kind of, you know, a, raise the mirror, you know, every time we have those kind of uh, arguments to dismiss any efforts in the South um, to change, uh, to, to reform and say, hey, uh, well, I'm not sure that, you know, the West is, 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 is even, is, is more homogeneous, right? Um, but it is also about looking at the international aid system, which we mentioned just earlier, not just about the, the multilateral organization. Um, there is this uh, movement of decolonizing aid, which uh, I'm quite fond of. Uh, I think it is also about decolonizing uh, knowledge, uh, uh, knowledge uh, production of knowledge, uh, uh, accepting that there are experiences, expertise, knowledge outside of the West that they do matter. Um, we talked about, uh, Madame Traoré was talking about uh, having that bottom-up uh, 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 efforts, and, and I think, you know, th this decolonization um, of the international system needs to happen um, to, to, so if we, if, we, if we want to achieve reform, I, I think it is the necessary path. Um, so, so obviously it is a, it is a tough uh, question. I, because I work with many peers across the South, from Brazil to India, uh, Senegal, South Africa, Indonesia, um, I see the very vibrant civil society, um, young people, less young people, uh, people that are not part of, gov of the governments, not part of international organizations that try to um, organize, that try to foster ideas, to bring them in the hand of the most powerful, uh, to try to inform policy decision making and, and way in negotiation. So in that sense, I'm a little hopeful, even though I remain a, a, a skeptical uh, optimist or an optimist skeptical. I had this discussion this morning. Um, but but I also think that obviously, you know, within the South, we also need to, to there, there's this question of, you know, the leaders as well, the, right? They need also to step up. Um, they need to support their populations. Um, and, uh, and, and there are also some other tougher questions that need to, to, to be discussed. The question of neoliberalism, the question of capitalism. It is extremely taboo uh, to discuss them in DC. Um, but uh, I'm hoping that uh, more discussions will be brought about um, this discussion because we, I, I don't think that we can, we can talk about the reform of the international governance system, of the international financial architecture, of international aid, which is also an economy in itself, without talking about this question of this underlying issue of neoliberalism, of capitalism, of, of economic domination, um, of, of a minority of actors over um, the majority world. So, um, you know, it's a set of, of extremely complex uh, issues. Uh, I believe that we are in a moment uh, that we must seize, we must grab, we must leverage, um, because I fear that if we do not, um, the question is, you know, what is it that we need? Do we need um, a new nuclear uh, bomb to be dropped uh, for the world to come together and to cooperate on these issues? Um, what do we need if not today is not, if today is not enough, what do we need? To, to move forward with those reform. Um, and, I, and, and just to finish on the BRICS, um, I think it's also important to look at non-BRICS members um, who are also actively working to push for these reforms. Um, the, the agenda of the reform of the, of the global governance system is not, you know, the BRICS doesn't have the monopoly on this question. Um, I always like to mention Barbados uh, and Prime Minister Mia Motley in particular, which has been working so hard on uh, promoting the Bridgestone Initiative the past few, few years, just last 
last, last year. Um, President Macron of France organized the Paris uh, uh, summit uh, 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 in, in cooperation with Barbados. Um, so I think it's also important to, especially in, in cities like DC, which is so much focused on great power competition um, and, and uh, you know, clinging onto this old world system and fearing to lose uh, power, I think it's also important to, 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 to center the debate on these on these other um, efforts and on these other initiatives that are being put in place by by all the other countries around the world, including Barbados. Thank you. Jean, the last word before we open to the floor. Well, I think it's absolutely necessary that we reform global governance. If you know, we have one country that issues a veto on. Uh, uh, for instance, the, what's happening in Cuba and vetoes, and then you know, Israel vetoes, votes are also in favor. We have an extremely unbalanced system. And it's one government that basically represents their corporations, as we saw in the film. So you know, today, we, Democrats or Republicans, they're working for corporations. That's who they represent. So if there's not a reform in the Security Council where countries of the global south have a voice, very, it's going to be very difficult to have any significant change. So I think it is, you know, I know my father has been fighting for a reform in the, the Security Council for over 20 years. It's not an easy task, but I think it's absolutely necessary. I do think the UN is important, and we should, in, instead of having everything imposed by the US, but somehow they manage, you know? So the embargo in Cuba is still there. You know, what's happening in Gaza is still there. You know, so it's, it's absolutely necessary that we, we, we fight for this. Will it happen or not? I don't know, but we have to look for the frestas, for the, in the slits, you know, of hope and try to fight for a better world. And I think that's, that's absolutely necessary. Thank you, Jean. So, your chance now to ask Jean or anyone else questions. The lady in the middle there first, and then uh, the gentleman here. The lady there. The microphone is coming. Yes. Bonsoir. En tout cas, je remercie uh, cette, uh, cette soirée et je voudrais juste rebondir sur tout ce qui a été dit jusqu'à maintenant par rapport à une expérience que moi j'ai été choquée à Genève au moment où il y avait, le, je crois que c'est une ONG qui avait souhaité uh, soumettre à une votation pour que les sociétés qui exploitent des mines et autres à l'extérieur, les sociétés suisses, puissent être traînées au tribunal en Suisse et j'ai pu remarquer dans, la, dans le bus un message qui passait qui disait « Si vous tenez à votre ordinateur, si vous voulez continuer à utiliser votre téléphone, il faut voter contre. » Ça veut dire que si la société, que ce soit en Europe ou en Afrique, n'est pas informé, on ne pourrait pas s'en sortir. Et je suis tout à fait d'accord avec ce que Mme Aminata a dit tout à l'heure, que c'est le temps de la société. Et je crois que l'Occident a maintenu sa propre population dans le, le, le manque d'information de la même façon qu'en Afrique, les gens ne sont pas au courant. Et la, société, la solution, pour moi, se trouve à ce niveau-là. Merci beaucoup. Merci, madame. Aminata, vous voulez répondre à ça <laughs> Très bien. I think the gentleman here in the middle. Thank you. I would like to come back to a quote uh, that was mentioned in the film, which is, education is understanding your place in the world. And from the problems you have identified, the inequality, the climate change, the global um, the wars that are um, expanding throughout the world, these cannot be changed in one generation. But one systemic problem that can be changed and should be changed in one generation is the equality between men and women. This could be changed within one generation if there would be political will to do that. But even if we do that, what would be the world, what would be the place in the world where women would find themselves in the current system? We have three women here, so you have the floor. But, but 
that we were actually just talking during the film, and we said, well, this is quite male-dominated, <laughs> the discussion. But anyway, um, I totally agree with you, but I'm, as I mentioned, I'm concerned about the kind of pushback on rights, and particularly also women rights. Um, so therefore, um, I, I would like to see a little bit more inclusion in many, many aspects. Um, but um, I think we have to fight for that. Um, but we are a long, long way uh, away. And there, there are a lot of glass ceilings for us, uh, wherever we are, be it in the public sector, private sector, international organizations. So. By the way, yesterday when the uh, CWS, uh, CSW sorry, in New York began, the first five speeches were made by men. Yeah. So that was uh, at the UN, at the General Assembly Hall. Um, so yes, it's a huge, huge uh, distance. Uh, Jean, do you want to comment on that as well? Um, I think we should have a lot of women comment. Yeah, would. No, exactly, men should comment on that. I'm sure you will. It, yes, um, thank, you for, thank you for the question. Uh, I mean, obviously, the, the question of gender equality and uh, representation and uh, uh, mi minorities, equality, uh, mi minorities uh, rights, just generally speaking, is, is obviously a fundamental one. Um, and I would like perhaps to even bring the question a little further. Uh, there is the, this, uh, you know, feminist foreign policy that some countries have adopted. Mexico is one of them. Uh, I'm by no means a, an expert of, of uh, feminist foreign policy, but um, I actually uh, had the pleasure to, to, to organize a panel where one of the, one of the uh, speaker from Mexico was explaining how foreign policy uh, could advance all the questions that we're, that we're talking about by um, looking at fundamental rights, uh, so minorities' rights, human rights, um, how, uh, for instance, it can be applied uh, to the question of global health, uh, looking at care, care um, um, uh, health carers, uh, and, and their place in the entire system uh, uh, beyond just the policy level. Um, so obviously, um, this is an important question. On a more practical basis, and I will speak about my experience as a think tanker. Um, you know, I, I, I think that there is uh, that there are efforts that are being put in place. Uh, uh, I sit in Washington, but it, it remains a very male-dominated uh, sector, in part and, and I, would, I would have said in particular the international policy sector, but this observation can be made really throughout all the fields. Um, so, so, you know, I think it is also something that uh, at the individual level, we also need to, to, to make sure that we put it forth in place. Uh, it can be as simple as, you know, in a panel, uh, in, a, in a film, for instance, uh, having speakers, writers. Uh, personally, in the Global South program, uh, in the Global South and the World Order program that I lead, this is a, this is a point, this is a, one of the major points, right? It's uh, the, the, one of the, the objective of the program is to address the, the representation as a whole um, of, of uh, uh, southern, uh, southern voices, but that means minorities, that means uh, 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 women. Um, so, so there are, obviously there is a big, if you look at only at the big picture, it is very easy to, to be um, highly skeptical, um, as you mentioned, about uh, how many generations it takes to make change. Um, but, uh, but, but I also believe that at the individual level, at, uh, and, and of course at the, at the collective uh, uh, level, uh, there are steps that, that we must uh, take uh, on a daily basis to ensure that we, 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 you know, we, we, we move the needle, as, as we say. Jean, actually in your movie, uh, in your film, there was a scene or basically a discussion on how some of these uh, um, gains uh, uh, of human rights and uh, women's rights were uh, in some way questioned. Uh, when Bolsonaro arrived. Um, how does that show that it's not something that is assured, uh, that is once you obtain, uh, it, is, it is granted? We've seen uh, uh, the case of Brazil was very clear. Yeah, I think it's, you know, education is essential. And I think a lot of the problems that we had and the reason Bolsonaro was elected has to do with education, <laughs> right? Especially access to uh, fundamental education on, the, you know, young kids. Uh, a lot of people in Brazil that benefited from uh, Lula's policies think they, 
it's their merit. They don't see that it was a social program that uh, actually helped them uh, evolve. So yes, none of the rights are, we can't, we can't take them for granted, right? So I, I think we have to keep the fight on, and I think, as our friend said, education is, is the way to go. Uh, it is very complicated because the means of uh, manipulation and of control now are very sophisticated through the big techs. You know, we have uh, social media controlling the youth and controlling boys and girls as well and diverting attention to things that are, are not uh, essential. And we have uh, in Brazil particularly, you know, the neo-Pentecostal evangelical churches that also play a very strong role in manipulating people. So we have, uh, and, and, and in fact, reinforcing what the extreme right uh, wants, which is to confuse and divide and uh, avoid progress in that way. So I think none of this, uh, we can't take any of that for granted. I do think there has been, you know, an evolution, but you know, as I said, two weeks ago we had this protest, this manifestation in São Paulo with hundreds of thousands of people. If you take, if you if you look at Brazil, uh, it's the it's because of the northeast, a small region, that Lula was elected. If you look at the south, the strong, the, the people that have the means, women included, they voted for Bolsonaro. We're going to have elections this year, and in most of the capitals of the south of Brazil, where the money is concentrated, the extreme right will probably win. You know, and they want to. We just have a new uh, person who is in charge of the education in, in Brazilian Congress. Um, and Nicholas, is, uh, it's so absurd. It's, it's, you're laughing, but it's so absurd. And that, that's- I'm nervous. I'm yes, it's, it's very, it's nerve wracking, right? It's nerve wracking. I see it with my own kids. I have a 11 year old and a 13 year old and the power that social media have, the screens have over them and how hard it is. It's an addiction, right? And this is worldwide. Boys and girls, you know, different. It's a very strong mechanism of control and atomization. So education is the key, and I, I think we can do more. And I think we need to do more. I think even in our country, Lula needs to do more. And I think one of the problems that he had was not emphasizing that in the first two mandates, to really empower people through education, especially women. Excellent. Do you have any other questions? We still have five minutes to go. Yes, uh, the, here first and then the lady. Uh, maybe we take the two questions at a time. Thank you for all, uh, is it working? Yes. Thank you for all uh, these remarks you made and congratulations once again for the film. M my question is to all of you. You seem to be in favor of changing the world order. Fine, I agree that the current world order is not the best one. But to change it somehow for the sake of changing it, because we will change the protagonist, but without clear values based on humanity, on human rights, on real democracy, of principle of non-aggression, does it will bring the real change we need? It wouldn't be better to join forces, progressive forces, all over the world, irrespective of borders, of frontiers, of states, because the ones that can make the real change are the ones that are progressive. The risk by changing the world order based on BRICS, you will get a different world order, but with the same spirit that is plundering the world. And uh, this, the last question there, the lady. Uh, sorry, she, okay, the last two questions. Hi. Um, there are a few things. I'm reading a book that comments that initially the BRICS was an idea of Goldman Sachs. And I find that very telling. I had read another book about BRICS and it stated that Russia is very invested in BRICS because it creates a power that opposes the monopoly that the US usually has. There are too many interests involved. And I would like to come back to what Odd said about, is it going to be a bomb that is going to make the difference? What we have seen throughout history is that the world really changes when there is a total catastrophe. 
And when it survives the catastrophe, then it starts creating something like, after the Second World War, the UN, and so on, which represents the, what the world was at that time. And change needs to happen now. Are we going to have to go through a terrible catastrophe in order to achieve it? And will we survive? Because I think it was Einstein who said, the third world war will be, and we will no longer exist. There is a risk. So where do we go from here? And I think there was a last question somewhere here. Madam? Or here, sorry, yes. Uh, it, it's less of a question than a, uh, I guess, a offer of, of information. Um, I have a feeling that um, there is a decolonization. Peut-être je vous le dis en français. Vous comprenez l'anglais comme un petit peu. Il y a une décolonisation dans une direction, une recolonisation dans une autre. Cette recolonisation est plus détaillée. On ne laisse aucune pierre euh, en place. Et elle est, elle est plus um, uh, uh, thorough, elle est, elle est plus entière. Et um, ce que je dis comme, uh, comme conseil aux jeunes Africains qui me demandent des fois, c'est uh, « faites bien attention à ce que vous faites uh, » n'interprétez pas l'inclusion comme euh, une carte verte pour commencer à exploiter votre propre peuple. Excellent. I think Aude wanted to answer to one of the questions. Yes, thank you. Um, I, I, will, I will tackle the first question on the question of the values. I think it is a very interesting debate, uh, one that has been particularly um, present uh, in DC, uh, especially a, around the concept of the Global South, um, the reform of the international system. It is one of the primary argument that is being used is the, you know, going back to this question of values. And I think there are, there are I think it is important to deconstruct and question a little bit of the, the assumptions that underlie this, this argument. Um, first, the, the universal values of human rights or, uh, uh, you know, uh, a, a, a territorial sovereignty and, and, all, and all these, the, the, I would say the West doesn't have the, the, the monopoly on, on these values, right? Um, most of the world share these values. And if you don't look just at the state level, but populations, I would say that probably that most populations, or if not all around the world, including in the global south do share these values, uh, even though sometimes they are represented by governments that um, do not adhere to them and do, uh, uh, do not take, uh, do not do, do actually take policies that, that undermine them. So I think there is this first deconstruction that needs to happen because we tend to portray these values as being solely Western, uh, which I think is, is, is plainly wrong. Uh, we, we, you know, uh, uh, we could uh, talk about the charter that was uh, born in, in West Africa, the Charter of, of Human Rights. We go you go in Latin America, the Maya civilization, in China, in the Middle East, um, uh, the pre-colonial times, we, we, we had uh, great documents talking about these rights, even though today, yes, we do have uh, uh, many governments today that, uh, that do not foster them, but we also need to take into account the, the, the whole historical context, I believe. Um, but again, uh, I don't think that what we are um, hearing in the South is, uh, you know, a call for or uh, chaos or uh, uh, and democratic values, or however you want to frame it. Uh, and again, I, I don't recall who said it, but I was in a conference lately, and there was this issue of, you know, someone said uh, we're not looking uh, to replace an hegemon with another one. Uh, you know, what we're looking for is a multipolar order and uh, multilateralism. So, in many sense, the, re the the calls for reform that you that you hear um, actually call for more multilateralism. They're calling for uh, the reinforcement of human rights. Uh, they're calling. For 
for equity, they're calling for equality. Um, I think it's also quite of a bias to to only point um, you know these questions when it comes to the global south and not look into the mirror. Um, I mean, I will take the United States. That's where I live, and I'm a black woman. Um, the United States has a systemic problem of uh, violation of human rights of uh, black people in particular, um, but just minorities, just a. a as a whole, we see the same issues uh, in Europe. We have um, the, you know, the, the far right uh, that is uh, growing in 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 Europe. Um, so, so you know, the, these debates, is, is, I think, is a, it is a it is a kind of a fake debate to me because uh, most of these countries, and again, I'm not saying everyone, but most of these countries are looking for an international system that is uh, more robustly uh, based on rights on. Values values, uh, which are universal. Um, they're looking uh, for a system that is equitable, where rules are not simply uh, dictated by one or a minority uh, and applied to, a, to, to the majority, while the same minority does not uh, follow the rules. Um, so to me, this, this, this debate, again, shows a little bit of the hypocrisy that we see in the West, um, the double standards as well. And, uh, and perhaps even more, uh, even worse, uh, misconceptions and uh, uh, deep misunderstanding and, uh, and lack of, of, of knowledge of, of the debates, of the realities, of the experiences um, that we find across the global south. Um, and, and again, I think you know we shouldn't uh, um, a, a, a punish populations for the choices of their leaders. Um, so that's that's. Uh, that's an interesting one uh, that I hear often in DC, but, uh, but, but yeah, I think it needs to be deconstructed. Um, and, and again, the BRICS, you know, the, the BRICS doesn't have the monopoly on the question of the reform. Um, and no. many countries do not want to join the BRICS for many reasons, um, but they're still looking for reform. Thank you. Aminata, you want to respond to the question in French? Oui, je retiens two questions. Le changement, quel changement, dans quelle perspective Je crois que c'est ce que vous voulez savoir. Et Madame a parlé de, il ne faut pas se tromper de décolonisation et que l'inclusion n'est pas nécessairement euh, un progrès. Moi, je me dis que et, ce qui serait formidable, mais vraiment extraordinaire pour les peuples qui ont subi le système jusqu'ici, c'est que et les BRICS euh, puissent euh, porter davantage, mettre l'accent davantage l'accent sur les humains, les humains et les communs, les humains et les communs. Euh, la question, la gouvernance, la, la, la question de la gouvernance est tellement galvaudée que j'ai pas envie d'y croire. J'ai pas envie d'y croire, d'autant plus que c'est est une notion qui a été lancée par la Banque mondiale. Elle nous est venue en tout cas de la Banque mondiale. Donc euh, moi, je, si gouvernance il y a, je voudrais que ce soit la gouvernance des communs au profit des humains. Quand je dis au profit des humains, je pense à, aux inégalités de plus en plus criantes. Et s'il y a un lieu où ça se vérifie, c'est chez nous. Et si je prends un pays comme l'Afrique du Sud, qui est censé faire partie des BRICS, Je me pose beaucoup de questions. Quand je dis les humains, les inégalités, mais aussi à l'intérieur des inégalités, mais même entre les composantes de nos sociétés malmenées, maltraitées, écrasées, il y a la question de la race. En tant que femme noire, George Floyd, tout ce qui se passe de par le monde, et où qu'on aille, y compris au sein des BRICS, la maltraitance et passe d'abord par la couleur de la peau. Alors moi, je voudrais... Et pour être vraiment convaincu que les choses vont dans le bon sens, je voudrais de bonnes réponses à ces questions. Est-ce que et les BRICS, pour être une alternative au modèle dominant, peuvent, et, disons, baliser la voie vers un monde où nous verrons dans l'autre tout simplement un semblable qui a droit à une vie décente qui a le droit de circuler librement, qui a le droit de choisir les gouvernants en fonction 
de, ses, de nos propres aspirations, non pas en fonction de ce que les dominants imposent comme valeur de société. Voilà. Uh, we ran out of time, uh, but I just want to thank you, all of you. And whatever new global order is established, the reality is that the reinvention of the future is already happening. Uh, climate change, an eventual new pandemic, wars, the nuclear threat, the obscene inequality requires us to search for a new pact. And it falls upon our generation, you just mentioned generations, but it does fall also in our generation, the task to give answers to challenges that will profoundly question all of us, as you mentioned. So thank you very much and thank you, Jean. <laughs>